On this face of the line, eternity of the Blessed Mother, I would like to begin by thanking our priests for coming to the battle lines, especially our priests that have come from a great distance. We have Father Christoph from Russia, Moscow, Father Riesling from Germany, and Father Miguel from France. And we'd like to also thank the priests um, throughout the United States that have come, especially on this occasion, to celebrate the Feast of Divine Eternity. And I'd like to <coughs> briefly explain about this feast. This feast was instituted in 1931 by Pope Pius XI. 1931 marked the 1,500th year of the Council of Ephesus. The Council was held in 431 AD. And as we know with the councils of the Church, the councils are always to address some emergency or some critical situation within the Church. And this so happened to be that there was a heretic named Nestorius. He was a bishop and he began preaching a heresy against the person of Christ. We know from sacred scripture very clearly, and we repeat this after Mass. As we conclude Mass, we read from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were made by Him. Without Him, made nothing has been made. And the Word was made flesh. This is talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. True God and true man. One person, but two natures. This mystery of the Incarnation was necessary to bring about the redemption. Adam had sinned. Man had sinned. Almighty God was offended. Man needed to suffer but man could by himself not make infinite atonement for this insult to Almighty God. It was only the God-man, Jesus Christ, who could make that infinite satisfaction and also suffer. Now very interestingly, Nestorius erroneously began to read this and that from Scripture and said, no, Jesus was two different people. There was the Godhead, the second person of the Trinity, and he descended into this man, Jesus, two different people. Now that would have not satisfied the redemption. If God had not suffered and died for us, we would not have been redeemed. No man and no angel, no creature could have made the infinite atonement. They had to come about by this wonderful mystery of the Incarnation and the mystery of redemption. But this also affected the relationship, according to the story, as if Jesus was two different people, two different persons, then Mary, the Blessed Virgin, would have not been the mother of God. When the stories began to preach this, he was denounced by his people. They would not hear of this. St. Cyril of Alexandria, rose up to defend the true doctrine. Nestorius was condemned as a heretic. And at the Council of Ephesus, they used the term to describe Mary as Theotokos, the mother of God. Not that this had been anything new. We read in the Gospel of St. Luke, where when Mary visited her cousin Elizabeth, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. She said, Blessed art thou, my woman, and blessed is the fruit of thy woman. How have I deserved that the mother of my Lord should come to me? When we think of our blessed mother's immaculate conception, her sinlessness, and all the wonderful virtues and prerogatives, we see that it all comes together because she was to be the mother of God. And when we think of our blessed mother, we are not only to think of her as the mother of Jesus Christ, mother of God, but also our divine Savior gave his mother to us. We live in very difficult times. 
I'm sure that many of you parents have a heavy heart when you see your children having to go out into the world and to try to make a living and make themselves a life. There's so many occasions of sin, there's so many snares that the devil has laid up for them. Satan is constantly attacking the church, creating confusion and division. He's working not only collectively out of the church, but also individually. He knows exactly our weaknesses. He knows our fallen human nature. He knows exactly how to tempt us. But it's not like God to allow these temptations and these snares of Satan without giving us some type of a counterbalance. How can we persevere in these times? And for this, our Lord not only has given us the Mass and the Sacraments, but very importantly, He has given us His own dear Mother. When we think of our Blessed Mother, our own spiritual mother, how important it is that we have that personal relationship with our Blessed Mother. It's not just some idea of the pious thought, but it's a reality. The Mother of God is my mother. And from heaven she watches over me. She protects me. That is the reason why it would be so foolish not to wear the brown scapular. Our Blessed Mother promised <clears throat> to those who die wearing this scapular, they will not suffer the fires of hell. What a wonderful promise that is. Our Blessed Mother, as we know in the history of the brown scapular, not only protected people spiritually, but even physically. Which reminds me, when I made my first Holy Communion, we were going to get enrolled in the brown scapular. And they were giving the brown scapulars with the white string of cords to the girls. And they're giving the brown scapulars with the brown cords to the boys. In my life, I was at the end and they were running out of the brown cords. <laughs> I am not wanting to put on a girl scapula. This is just not going to be cool at all. And there's a lot of temptations and have uncharitable thoughts about our pastor, Father Man. Why did you talk to Sister Mary Grace? We can count. <laughs> we can count on a boy and a girl, but we get a girl's scapula. So I was thinking about a way out and thinking, okay, if I get a girl's scapula, I want to be enrolled. I want to wear that scapula. I'm going to stuff it down my shirt so fast that you wouldn't even know what happened. I had to communion rail, sweating it out, and do it again. I stand with the brown cord. Thank you, Blessed Mother. Thank you. I wore the scapular out and show everybody that I have a scapular out of roll. But when I think of the brown scapular, we think of that as Our Lady's garment that she gave to St. Simon Stock. She's told St. Dominic one day by the scapular and the rosary, the world will be saved. We also have the beautiful devotion of the Holy Rosary. It combines both vocal prayer and mental prayer. Pope Leo XIII, he wrote an encyclical letter for every year of his pontificate in honor of the Holy Rosary. There are so many significant events in the history of the Church of Our Lady in a very significant way in intervening for the Church by praying, the people praying the Rosary, especially the Battle of Lepanto. When, when Time, I think, was a year, year and a half ago. A girl graduated, called me up, and she said, You know, uh, I have a friend of mine who he's Protestant, and, you know, from work, and he was asking about the rosary, kind of putting it down. What should I say? I said, The rosary is totally biblical, it is totally scriptural. We pray primarily the Our Father and the Hail Mary. Both of those prayers are found in the sacred scripture. When the apostles asked Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray, he said, When you pray, pray thus, Our Father who art in heaven. That's right, the gospel. The Hail Mary, the gospel of St. Luke. The angel Gabriel was sent by God. And what did the angel say? Hail, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, one woman. 
And Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Ghost, cried out, Blessed art thou in the woman, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 2, at the wedding feast of Cana, Jesus worked his first miracle at Mary's request. And that is the reason why we end with Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Now, and especially at the hour of our death, when Satan makes an all out attempt to get us away from God. I told this young lady, tell your friend, we don't just read the Bible, we meditate on the Bible. The joyful mysteries, the annunciation, the visitation, the nativity, found in the Gospel of St. Luke and the Gospel of St. Matthew, the presentation of the temple, the finding in the temple, the sorrowful mysteries, the agony, the scourging, the crowning of thorns, the carrying the cross of crucifixion, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the glorious mysteries, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for the resurrection, for the ascension, for Pentecost, Acts of the Apostles for Pentecost, we also have the Apocalypse, a woman below with the sun and moon at her feet and on her head, crown of twelve stars. Everything that we do when we pray the rosary is totally biblical. So the next time I saw her, I said, well, how did it go? She just gave me like, it wasn't like he couldn't answer it at all. Well, I guess, well, maybe he was something to think about. But the rosary, that powerful weapon, is so simple and yet prolonged. We cannot meditate well enough on the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. We cannot ponder the virtues of our Blessed Mother sufficiently. There's so much to consider. I, I know we've speak, spoken of this before, but this past Christmas, I saw something posted by a Protestant woman. She was Methodist. And she said, she had read the Gospel of St. Luke and read Mary's Magnificat. My soul doth magnify the Lord, my spirit rejoices for God, my Savior. She said, I can't believe this. I've read the Bible so many times. This prayer of Mary is so profound. It is so wonderful. Coming forth from the depths of her heart and soul, I can't believe I've never seen this before. So this Methodist woman posted and says, how many of you are Protestants? I'm Catholic and Protestants. How many of you have ever read this before? Some said never read it. Some said, yeah, but didn't think of any big deal. And she said, I find that absolutely incredible. The words of Mary, Christ within her, saying these things. But I would like to add to what she had to say. Our Blessed Mother prophesied, Henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. We fulfill that prophecy of our Lady. We honor her as the Mother of God. We show her love, reverence, and as our spiritual mother, how important it is that we try to imitate our Blessed Mother. Let us remember, these are very difficult times. Let us not think that I've been in a traditional movement for a hundred years. Nothing's going to happen to me. Don't count. Satan knows exactly where to attack, what snare us to lay, and how to bring people down. Over the years, how many people we thought, oh, they're such a pillar, and those pillars have come down, been crumbled. Maybe, perhaps, part because they trusted too much in themselves and not enough in our Blessed Mother for powerful intercession. Remember, Satan, he's a fallen angel. He's still very smart, very clever. Smarter than, if you took the dumbest devil, he'd be more intelligent than all the Einsteins that ever came into this world. The dumbest devil. And if Satan and his legions are so clever, they are, we have no match for that. And not only that, we all have a fall of human nature, and the devil's going to exploit that like you can't believe. As we celebrate the apparition of the Lady of Fatima at the Fatima Conference, we're reminded that our mother 
Mary, the mother of God, has loved us, and she's come to warn mankind in 1917. Two years ago, we celebrated the 100th anniversary. And as we said two years ago, we repeat today, the message of Fatima is more relevant today than ever before. I have come to ask mankind to amend. It must cease offending God already so much offended. War is a punishment for sin. Russia will spread her errors. More souls go to hell for the sins of the flesh than for any other reason. Certain styles of fashion will be introduced that will gravely offend my divine son. Pray the rosary every day. My immaculate heart will be your refuge. In the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. I know we've talked about this before. Some of you might have not heard it. Some of you may have forgotten. They say to remember something, I'll repeat it seven times, so I think it's about the third or fourth time, so next time I come, I'll say it again. <laughs> when our Blessed Mother said at the end, my man, triumph, there are some who I think erroneously think that in the end, the whole world will be converted and you're going to turn on the radio and you must get this channel, the Glorian Chant, that channel, the Glorian Chant. And you're going to pick up the newspaper and front page and be lies and the saints and everything will be spiritual and it is wonderful. But that's not what our Lord tells us. He says, Think ye when the Son of Man comes again, he will find faith on the earth. It's going to get really, really difficult. How many have already lost the faith in the past? so many years because of Vatican II of the apostasy and the modern and civilian church, which is not the Catholic Church. Yes, we think of what's happened in the church, we think of what's happened in society, and we can only just stay close to our Blessed Mother because we know the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And I think that is the triumph of Mary's matter of the heart. Satan has used his utmost to destroy the faith and to destroy souls and try to destroy the church. But through Mary's powerful intercession, she will intercede for us that we might persevere and the gates of hell will not prevail. And her immaculate heart will indeed triumph. You know, I... I Thought about this so much. Don't like getting long sermons. You know, I said, oh, that's such a way to do this. I'm do long sermons. Uh, but I just like to say this. When you look at what has happened in the church, especially out in the 1960s, I forgot even to, how cleverly orchestrated the changes were initiated. This is just no human genius that has figured this out. This is diabolic, it's satanic knowing exactly what to say, how to say it, what excuses to make, and to destroy the church from within. But you know, despite that, and this is, to me, the powerful intercession of Our Lady, we have Catholic, Catholic mass centers, churches, chapels around the country, we have Catholic bishops, priests, and clergy, we have religious, we have laity, who are truly being nothing but Catholic. I met a man on a plane coming into Spokane. He was very well informed, but modern Catholic, but very conservative. And he wanted to know where he was, where I'm from, and whatever. He understood exactly, understood exactly, by the time the plane landed, he understood exactly who we were. He actually said, What does that term in Latin say? I said, Say to the conscious. His picture is empty. There's no pope. You know what? He didn't have a problem with that. He said, I just shaved my head. He said, I can't believe what's happening in the church today. He's like, how can he say these things? How can they do these things? I could have said, duh. <laughs> the enemies of the church said they're going to infiltrate. They said this. That's exactly what the Masons said. Their ultimate vendetta against the church was to infiltrate and get their own man on the throne. The Masons said this. The communists know that the one obstacle to world domination is Catholicism, the Catholic Church. 
Of course they're going to try to destroy the church and discredit it. And enemies of the church said this, we're not going to destroy the institution. We're going to infiltrate and destroy people's faith using the institution. How clever Satan has been. Our Lord even warned about this. He says, Satan will try, if possible, even to deceive the elect. When we look above the altar, we see our blessed mother standing at the foot of the altar, and we see one apostle. Where is the others? Oh, Judas had betrayed our Lord and hung himself. Where are the other ten? They ran and hid out of fear. Only one apostle persevered to the foot of the cross. And as some saintly writers have said, it's because St. John was in company with our reading. The church is going through a crucifixion, no question about that. It's the apostasy. And if we're going to persevere, and you look up at St. John, then we had better stay close to our Blessed Mother. And let us not make any excuses for not wearing your scapula, not praying our rosary. I'm too tired. I got so much to do. Uh, no excuses. Let's pray our rosary faithfully every day. Let us wear her scapula always. And let us live our consecration. When our Blessed Mother asks for consecration to our Immaculate Heart, Sister Lucia said, it's the Monfort consecration, according to St. Louis de Monfort. Six popes have recommended and practiced total consecration to our Lady. If you're not familiar with it, like you recommended on a bookstore, ask Sister what's about this. There's a book, The Secret of the Rosary, to Devotion to Mary, the Reign of Jesus the Lord. A lot of good books explaining it, simple, beautiful, but let us remember the importance of living in consecration. And in a nutshell, what is it? Total consecration there is complete dependence on Mary as a mother for all things. Whenever I have something very important to do, such as offer mass, I ask Mary, stand on me, help me. My blessed mother, when I give a sermon, stand on me, help me. You know what our blessed mother is telling me? I better end this sermon. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.